Philippians chapter 4 from verses 10. This is Paul writing to the church of Philippia, uh, to the church of Philippi, after he had received support. There was an offering that he had received. I don't know if I should call it an offering because offering can be called differently. But it was a support just to help him support him in his ministry. Now he's writing to them and this is what he's saying. Saying, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have renewed your care for me. You are in fact concerned about me, but lack the opportunity to show it. Verses 11. Not that I speak in regard to need. Let me read from this because a number of you are looking at it. I do not say this out of need. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. Let's proceed. I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any in any and in all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether when fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I think we can read the last verse, verse 13, which most of you now know. <laughs> <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. So with another scripture in Hebrews chapter number 13, and then I say a few things as we begin. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning from verses 4. Hebrews 13, beginning from verses 4. Now this amazed me how it was framed, but we look at it. It says marriage, of course you wonder what marriage has to do with contentment. <laughs> marriage is honorable in all... Which version of this? <laughs> no, this is Kate. In James, I know in James is authorized version, but I just bring you to the verse, the version you are going to understand. Marriage must be respected by all, and the marriage bed kept and defined, because God will judge immoral people and adulterers. Uh -huh. Your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. Another version says, be contented with what you have. For he himself has said, has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I know you know verses 5. <laughs> Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your people that you brought here to be gathered, oh God, to hear your word. I pray that you give me grace to explain these things, gracious Father, that as they leave this place, they'll be blessed of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. amen and amen. It's amazing how, I would, how, when I was thinking about this topic, one of the things I, I wondered, when was the last time, live alone Christian Union, I thank God for the Christian Union, because Christian Union gives us an opportunity to hear certain subjects that otherwise we would never have heard of. Tell me the last time you heard of the topic contentment in your local church. Have you ever heard somebody preach about contentment in your local church? Well, let me put it this way. How many times have we ever heard the, word, the topic contentment being preached? Of course, I don't know whether it's in CU it has ever been preached, but CU probably normally gives opportunity for that. Being preached since you are born again. Very rare. Very rare. This is a very rare topic. And as I was thinking, what, what is, why is it that people don't talk about contentment? Because if you think about love, love is being spoken about. If you think about relationships and all those things, we hear about those things. If you think about things like giving, we hear about giving. But on contentment, if you think about blessings, the topic on blessings, we hear about that almost very often. Even today, probably when you are listening to the radio, or you don't listen to the radio here. <laughs> you are watching the YouTube or you are looking at the TV, you heard something about blessings. We hear these topics again and again. But rarely do we hear the topic on contentment. Does it mean that God is not concerned about it? I want to tell us that God is concerned about it. And the word of God is so full 
of the word contentment. I, don't not, I, did, I did not have time to just gather all these scriptures to help us understand this. And the reason why I think we do not hear much about contentment is either if something is not being spoken about, the only two reasons. One could be is because we've mastered it and we do not need it. Okay? For example, what have you mastered that you don't need to be taught? One plus one. Huh? One plus one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to be taught such things because you've become so efficient in it. Or it's because we do not like it. And I think the last reason is the correct one. So I wondered why is it that CU is calling me to preach about what we do not like. <laughs> so today I'm going to expose you to certain scriptures that you rarely hear of. And they are closely connected to the scriptures you love. Yet you rarely hear about them. And by the grace of God I'm going to point them out in your Bible. And call you to believe God. Amen. Amen. My struggle and my prayer is that God is going to raise a people in this place. Whose hearts are longing to do the word of God. It does not matter what the word of God says. We need to reach a point where we are not cutting the word of God looking for what we like. Yeah. Where I've reached a point, I'm just saying, what is the word of God saying? When God is saying we go north, I may not want to go north, but I follow. Yeah. Currently, I've been doing, I was reading the book of Numbers, and the cloud, the children of Israel were following the cloud. And sometimes the cloud will settle in very bad places. But the scripture says, when the cloud settled, they stood. They did not move, whether they liked that place or not. I was reading a place where the cloud settled. It was such an amazing place. It had palm trees. It had almost like seven or, I think seven or twelve wells of water. It was an amazing place. The cloud settled there. And then the cloud moved from that place and settled to a place called Sin. There's a place that was called Sin. Though not Sin of Sin. But Sin, I think, I don't know what that means in Hebrew. That was, it was a dry place, a bad place, but the cloud settled there. So their, their life was to follow the cloud. If the cloud have settled where they do not like, they stay there. Amen. Amen. So I pray that by the grace of God, as I share these things, some of them may not be what relates with our natural desire. But I pray that God is going to give you a heart that prays that God, I want to do your work. I do not just want to do what I like. I want to do your work. Amen. 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 Therefore, Paul begins us off with the scripture that I read in him, in, in, in uh, Philippians chapter chapter 4 with an amazing portion of scripture. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul introduces us to the word contentment. I told you that this is not a rare thing in the scripture, even though we rarely speak about it. We rarely speak about it. Paul lived it out. Paul preached it. Paul shared it. And I'm going to show you how he shared it to different people and how he lived it. So for example, in Philippians chapter 4, he's just received a blessing from the church. A group of people have gathered together and have brought Paul a gift. Paul was a full-time minister of the gospel, and once in a while people were going to people would support him. But in other occasions, he would also refuse the offering from other places. I wonder where there are men of God today who are not so quick to gather offerings. Today we are so many men of God whose eyes are just looking for offerings. For example, when he goes to the Thessalonians. He refuses to collect offerings from them. The Bible says he was making tents and collecting offerings from the tents that he was making. Why was it doing that? Because there was laziness in the, in the Thessalonian church. When he goes to the Corinth, they also did not receive an offering from them. He was not a preacher whose eyes was just looking at the pocket of people. Today we are full of such preachers whose aim is just looking at what are you driving, where are you coming from. But Paul was a man of God whose life was not being lived like that. So in this occasion, but in this occasion he received an offering from the Philippian church. And this is what he tells them in verses 10. He tells them, I rejoice in the Lord. He does not say, I rejoice in your offering. He says, I rejoice in the Lord. My joy is in Jesus. My joy is in Jesus. Most of people, most, most of the preachers probably will say, I rejoice in the Lord, but they know where their joy is. But Paul here is writing to them, inspired by the Spirit of God. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. I rejoice in the Lord greatly. He's just received a gift, but his eyes is not looking at that gift. His joy is in Jesus. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now, at last, your care for me has been flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. I'm desiring to read an IV, but I think this is the King James. A number of you have an IV. 
So I'll read from NIV, just bear with me. Because there are a few things I wanted to highlight from there. <laughs> it says, it starts by saying, that I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you are concerned, but you had, you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need. Now, Paul was in need, but he was not saying that because he wanted to collect an offering. He's saying, I am not saying the things I'm saying because I am in need. If you continue reading, at some point, even preaches about that, uh, especially, I think it must be verses 19, where he's saying, my God shall, shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's not saying these things because he wants to collect something from the people. Even though he was in need, that is not how he handled the ministry. He's saying, I am not saying these things because I call I am in need. For I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. <laughs> now, it did not come to Paul by anointing. Yeah. Contentment does not come by laying of hands. Paul said, I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. It is not going to come because you are going to pray and lay hands on people. It's going to come by learning. Paul himself had to learn it. He was a man of prayer. He was a man who walked with God. But when it came to this virtue, he said, I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. Now, what is amazing to me here, it does not say <laughs> that I have learned to be, yeah, he's, he's not talking about that he's going to be content because he has received what he has received. He has not received the gift and now saying, because I've received this now, I am satisfied. Actually, he's telling them, even that, before that thing came, I was already contented. So my contentment is not based on what you've given me. My heart is already satisfied. My joy is in the Lord Jesus greatly. So I'm not waiting for what you're going to give me to be satisfied. Paul is saying, I have learned. It is in past tense. It is something that is already acquired. I have learned to be a satisfied preacher. I have learned to be a satisfied man of God in whatever the circumstance. Now, this is amazing me because Paul is saying he's not just learned to be contented in good circumstances. He's saying I have learned to be contented in whatever the circumstance. Whatever the circumstance. Let's continue reading and hear how he explains this. He's saying I know what it is to be in need. What a preacher. A preacher that can identify with people that he need. He say, I know what it is to be need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. <laughs> Here is where I want to read for you in the King James Version. Verses 12. He says, I know how to be. Of course, the verse two words are tough English, you may not like them. I know how to be a best and I know how to be abound. Abound, I think you know. Everywhere and in all things. I'm pointing out those things because I want to explain them. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be angry, hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. Now, Paul is saying that he has learned to be contented in whatever that is happening in his life. Today, the topic of contentment is such, a, is such a rare topic. It's a rare topic. Why? Because more than, a, a lot of preaching actually disturb us not to be contented. A lot of preachings are charging us not to be contented with what God is doing in our life. But Paul says, for me, I do not care what is happening. I'm not waiting for the offering to come for me to be contented. I'm not waiting for hell to knock for me to be contented. Whether hell has come or not, my joy is still in <laughs> he says in whatever circumstance he was not a believer who would come and pray and say God if you do not bring food today I am leaving you you know there are so many people who pray with threatening God yeah. let me ask you today, what can you do even if you threaten God <laughs> what can you do nothing you should think about the mercy of God God has saved you <clears throat> and God wants to develop certain virtues in you some of these scriptures are rarely taught. So bear with me as I read them. For example, if you read James, 
I told you, call me to preach a difficult topic. So I'm going to preach it by the grace of God. And I'm just going to give you scriptures. For example, in James chapter number 1, listen to what James is saying. James is saying, My brethren, count it all joy. I wonder which preacher you ever heard saying that. When you fall into various trials, consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. Ukipitia magumu. The Bible says, count it all joy. Now, they don't tell you that, but it is written in your Bible. The Bible says, when you go through difficult times, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Continue in verses 2, verses the next verse. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Other versions say, produces what? Perseverance. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. But endurance must do its complete work. I don't know whether that one we should read in the NIV. In NIV, there's a way NIV says it. If you read verses 4, NIV says let. I don't know who has an NIV version. Does it have the word let? It says, read it for us. Uh -huh. Manu. At least I've now seen you. Manu, I've not seen you. <laughs> yes, read. Read verses 4. Read verses 4. Which, which version says let? NIV has let. Maybe that is maybe NIV 20. <laughs> <laughs> but NIV is let, says read it for us who has it. Let perseverance finish its work so that we may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Yes, he's saying let. Do you know the meaning of the word let? Achana nai, imalize kaziyaki. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, lacking in nothing. Amen. Amen. So, this is what Paul is telling us here. Because sometimes when you go through difficulties, we think that God has forsaken us. For Paul, he was not thinking so. He was saying, whatever the circumstances I, I am in, it's not that God has forsaken me. He knew. I'm going to read for us a scripture that I read in Hebrews that is going to bless our heart, that is going to help us know that when you go through some of these things, it does not mean that God has forsaken you. So Paul is calling us for perseverance, not perseverance, but for contentment in whatever the state I am in. Do you know how most of us think? You see, when I'll get a job, and this is an appointment to shake. But Paul is saying, he's not saying when he gets the job, Paul is saying, I am contented in whatever. As you're waiting, when you're going to drive that dream car, then you're going to be contented. Now this is not the scripture. This, the believer is a man who is contented in his present state. Mm -hmm. A believer is not a person who is looking forward for something to be contented. What are you looking forward to when you already have Jesus? Yeah. What can be greater than the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus is the great. He's our call in all. Amen. Amen. When I have Jesus, there's nothing greater that I'm looking for. That can make me to be contented. When I receive Jesus, that is the day I receive my contentment. So these other things that come to my life, they are just an addition, but they are not things that add to my contentment. Amen. Amen. So Paul, having received Jesus, is saying, now me, I do not care. Whatever comes to my life is just an addition. Whatever is getting away is just getting away. But I am already satisfied because I know the Lord. He said, I greatly rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that makes us contented. It is Jesus that makes us contented. He does not just say in whatever is happening. He also says, in wherever place, are you in campus or are you back at home? In wherever place, I am contented. Now we are going to do leadership nominations. Some of you, God is going to place you where you are not expecting. Paul says, in wherever and in whichever place, I am contented. I want you to think like Paul. He was not waiting for anything. He says in whichever place. I don't know whether he placed that version. Nibi James says it this way. Okay, let me just see. And I know how to have a lot. In any and in all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. In any and in every circumstances. Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content. So the call today is that God is calling you not to be contented when you have arrived, to be contented today. A true believer is contented today. Is contented today. 
And that is the call of God for you to be contented today. Now, that is not just something he lived himself. Let me finish it up in verses 13. Now, verses 13 you know, but I'm so sorry that you've never read all these verses. <laughs> it's amazing how they pick out of a verse yeah. and expound on that verse and they do not give you the context. Now, what we've just read is the context of verses 13. Paul was saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Which all things? To be angry and yeah. to be full. So you're saying, even if I am angry, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's saying, I've received the strength of Christ even when things are not working well. I can do all things. Today I know we quote, I can do all things when we do exams, but we do not quote it in the context in which Paul said it. And because of that, we miss the call of God to be contented in whatever the circumstances that God has placed us here. He writes to Timothy, I'll come to that Hebrews. This is not just how he lived alone. When he's about to die, he writes to his young disciple, Timothy. In cha Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Chapter 6, rather. Verse 6. He writes to Timothy something that is amazing that I want to call to our attention also. Timothy, the first, first Timothy, chapter 6, verse 6. <clears throat> I want you to remember that verse. Because also, these verses are rarely read. And I said, I told you that we rarely hear about these preachings in our churches. So today I'm going to give you other verses that we rarely hear of, but they're in your Bible. That's why when we in discipleship, we insist for you to read the whole Bible. So that you just don't know verses like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some of you just feed on, 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 on the junk food. You need to feed on solid food. Some of these food are so difficult, but we still feed on them. Amen. Amen. We do not know, by the way, for example, what is happening to some believers. There are so many believers in certain countries like Iraq who cannot even gather in these places. They are so persecuted. They cannot even own a single thing. I tell you, we are going to meet with those people in heaven. Yeah. So that if our faith is only waiting to be contented because of what we have, we do not know Jesus. Because how can we call a brother in Iraq who loves the Lord passionately, but because he loves the Lord, he cannot register in anything because he is going to be asked to declare his faith. So he can't even buy a car. This is how some of our brothers live. And we must live in the light of them. Text him, but godliness with contentment is a great gain. Now, let me explain that verse again. Now, Paul is about to leave. Timothy is taking over as a young man. Paul is writing to him. He knows the ambition and the passion in the life of young people. He knows the desire. And he's telling Timothy, Timothy, I know you want to be godly, but to your godliness are with contentment. Mm -hmm. To your godliness are with contentment. There are so many snares in this world today that if you're not contented, you're going to find your life in trouble. Mm -hmm. He tells Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, he's not saying godliness with contentment will be great gain. He's saying godliness with contentment is great gain. A person who is contented is already living in great gain. Yeah. Why is it that they do not preach to us great gain? Do you know there are people who are just looking in the Bible great gain? about the beams of the year. If you go to some churches, <laughs> the beams just walk around great gain. But I wish they would call us also here. Because this is also in the Bible. The Bible says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. This is Paul talking. I desire that God is going to give us grace to listen to such men. Yeah. Nothing out of it. And the same is going to apply to us. One day you are going to leave. You are going to take nothing out of it. So be contented. Be contented. The Bible says, for we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. Now some of you probably think that contentment is laziness. It is not. Some of us thinking contentment is not working hard, is not becoming great and doing great things. The person who is telling us this thing, none of, I don't know who can compare with him, who, who has ever lived in this one, because if this is Paul, who was greater than Paul, tell me, who had known God than Paul. Nobody. So contentment, who, who was such a hard working, you need to read Corinthians when Paul talks about hard work. 
He says, I knew sleepless nights. That was a man who was working hard. So contentment does not mean laziness. Jesus is the perfect example of contentment. And he was not lazy. Contentment does not mean that we do not desire change. That we are just people of status quo. No. Jesus brought change. He says, actually, I brought sword. I brought enmity between whatever. There are so many things that Jesus destroyed a lot of status quo. When Pharisees were the people that were ruling, when Jesus came, he shook them. It is not that I just lead on the status quo. No, that is not easy. What, what, what contentment is. Paul said, we brought nothing into this world and you can be sure that you will take nothing out of it. Recently, I was thinking about that rich young ruler. Remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he came to Jesus in such an amazing way. He's coming to Jesus and telling Jesus, Master, what can I do to have eternal life? You remember that, man? I want eternal life. What can I do to have eternal life? Jesus is telling him, do you know the commandments? Yes, I know the commandments. Have you kept them? I have kept them. And Jesus is telling him, go sell these things and follow me. That became difficult and he left. Now, you know what I thought? I thought the reason why that man wanted eternal life is because he now has everything. What he wants is now to live forever. He cannot imagine living the things he has done. <laughs> and that is probably what makes life difficult. Because we think that we will not live. Paul said you can take nothing out of it. So I was thinking, I think it was today or yesterday, when that man was dying, probably said, I wish I would have listened to that man. Because now I cannot take these things with me. The Bible says, Bra brother and sister, remember, you brought nothing into this world and you can take nothing out of it. You brought nothing. Even if you go to Jesus, Jesus knew his heart. That is why Jesus did not have to encourage him about eternal life. Jesus was a bad evangelist. Evangelist is not very quick to, to register the soul that is received. <laughs> he just went. And Jesus said, it is very difficult for this man to be born again, even though he has kept the law. His interest was not to follow Jesus. His interest was to just have life because he had a right. Verses 8 says this. I know verses 8 probably is also another not sweet scripture, but you are going to read it. Today I'm going to give you certain scriptures. <laughs> but it says, but if you have food and glory, we, Paul included, be content with this. Now that is shocking. Paul is not saying, if you have food, clothing, and a house. For Paul, if you have and you have food, 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 you have yeah. You need to read Paul. A number of times Paul slept us outside. If you read John 18, and at some point Jesus also slept outside. <laughs> it's true. Read it, read in your Bible. Paul says, but if we cease to give an achapula and go to Petosheka. <laughs> Contentment is such a, I'm telling you the person who has Jesus is so satisfied. That anything the Lord brings his way is just an addition. Yeah. His life is not running on a house. His life is running on Christ Jesus. Have you treasured Jesus so much that Jesus means everything to you? That even if you lack anything, you are so satisfied in Jesus. God is calling us to love Jesus so much that even if you have nothing, you can stand up and thank God. Say, Jesus, I love you. I am so happy in Jesus. And I am so happy in Jesus. There's a verse that I do not want to take us in Psalms 37 verses 4. That says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, you do not sometimes understand that. It does not say, delight, you will normally just interpret that be happy in the Lord and the Lord is going to give you the desires of your heart. But that scripture means, I am already delighted in the Lord and because I am so happy in the Lord, the Lord gives me the desires of my heart. It is not the desires of my heart that is going to make me be happy in the Lord. I was already delighted in the Lord. Then the Lord gives me the desires of my heart. That is how it goes. I am so happy in the Lord. Paul is telling them, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Not in your giving. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. In that psalm, he tells us, delight yourself in the Lord. Then the Lord is going to give you the desires of your heart. But today we live in a way where believers are not happy in Jesus. We say, oh Jesus, if you do not give me this, you are not a good God. Who tells you that the goodness of God is defined by the temporary things?
that you are going to be. Yeah. The goodness of God is defined by the fact that God gave Jesus to die for you as sinner. That is the goodness of God. The Bible says, while you are still sinners, while you are still sinners, God gave Jesus to die for us. That is love. That is the epitome of the goodness of God. Not anything else you want to define about the goodness of God. Because otherwise, how are we going to define the lives of believers? I have read church history. Some of you that have come in my house, you know I have a very huge books and library. Some of you have visited me. I've read a lot of church history. You need to read church history. How some of the brethren that lived survived. Some of them were persecuted. You know, today's your apostles just like Jets. He tampered some of these apostles. You need to read the old China when there was war. Christians were being persecuted. They were being burnt at stake. There was somebody who was called Neo was burning Christians at stake. And the Christians were happy to be burnt. Because they knew they had a home. In Hebrew, the Bible says they were looking forward to a city whose builder is not man. They were looking forward to a city. The reason why so many people today are not looking forward to God, to Jesus' second coming, is because of lack of contentment. I've always challenged young people that if they were to hear that Jesus is to come tomorrow or next year, some of you will get discouraged because you've not gotten married or because you've not gotten a job or because you've not driven your dream car. Your joy is not in Jesus. And if that is not the state of your heart, perhaps you're not a believer. The Bible says they were looking forward to a seat whose builder was not man. And then it asked there that God therefore was not ashamed. I think it is, is it God or Jesus? Was not ashamed to call them his brethren. What a joy. For people that are looking forward to Jesus. In verses 8, it tells us, go back to that scripture that we are reading. Verses 8, it tells us, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these things. But look at the lives of so many of us. God has given us a lot. Oh, how we want to be thankful. I want to tell you, my friends, if you are not contented where you are now, you will not be contented where you are going to go to. It's true. Think about when you are in high school, how you are thinking about going to university, and when you go to university, now you come to this university, you are now not again contented. You are going to get the job, you are not going to get contented. If God has not given you the secret to learn to be contented in whichever place you are, I can tell you, there is no place you will be contented. There is no place you will be contented. Verses 9 says this. Now, verses 9 you don't like, but it is in your Bible. <laughs> I don't know that that has ever been read in this scene. This should, this should bother you for the rest of this. You say, but those who want to be rich, fall into temptation. Now, allow me not to explain that verse, because some of you want me to explain it. And it is just as clear as it is written there. So I'm not going to explain it away. Yeah, I'm not going to explain it away. It is clear. If, it were, if for example, if it was written, that those who want sexual those, those who want to commit sexual immorality are going to whatever, get tempted and all those things. You would not have told me, when Paul tells Timothy, please sexual immorality, you need to explain that. It is just as obvious. So I'll just read it, I'll just read it three times so that it's sink on you and then I read it. <laughs> so, but those who want to be rich fall into temptation. Now, I don't know that I'm loving how this has transgressed it. It says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish, and to many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and Destruction. Now let me say a few things concerning this thing. The Bible does not say it is wrong to be rich if you read the scriptures. But if that is the driving factor in your life, the Bible promises you will fall into many temptations. I know of girls in this campus who because they knew a brother who was studying at a very prestigious course, they made a faulty decision and their life now is fine. There's a girl we advised with one of my friends. There's a young man who was interested in her. We talked with her, told her, but they go for this man. And she watched, she had seen another man who had gone outside, he's making a lot of money, and that is where her heart was. Because she wanted quick, quick wealth, she wanted quick gain. She fell into many temptations. 
and travel. What informs your decision making? What informs your decision making? Are your decision making informed with satisfaction in Jesus? Or your decision making is informed with just man? What informs your decision making, my friend? The Bible says there's nothing wrong with getting rich. But it says if that is what I live for, if that is what I wake up thinking, I'm going to fall into many temptations. I can give you so many stories. I remember there's one of my relatives I was advising. There was this, there's this thing that was coming to you, you invest 25,000 and you're going to be handing this amount of money. I don't know how it's called, but there's, there's big coins, big cryptocurrencies. I don't know how. They, they had so many names that were coming. Some, so many people invested in that money. I remember there's a girl I sat with. She called me in some hotel. We sat, talked. I remember in another day, it was my birthday. We talked to almost they'd come to visit. We talked and I advised and told her, but hey, you cannot go this way. She could, she could not hear me. She lost her 100,000. And her heart was broken. Because her mission was just getting rich. What informs your decision making, young girl? Why are you dating the man you want today? Why are you insisting that you must have a boyfriend in Lorcamete? But it is in that we are thinking about. Is it not because you are thinking this is a lawyer and that your life is going to change? Is that a decision that is informed with a person that is satisfied in Jesus Christ? I want to tell you, God has promised. You know, we sometimes just think promises are. Yeah. yeah. This is also a promise. Those who want to be rich fall. Let me read this. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptations and a snare. And then listen, and into many foolish things. I can tell you examples of people that have fallen into foolish things because they were only living for one thing, money. They are all living for that car. So if they did not matter what, how it means to get that car. Today in workplaces, people have compromised their lives because they just want promotion. I want to challenge you that God is saying those who only live to get rich fall into too many temptations. And that even in ministry, has affected so many call pastors. There are so many people who today just call people. They bring false testimony. They make people false fall in a way and preach certain things that only people want to hear because they want people's money. Where are the men of God who will be daring to tell people the truth? Yeah. We desire that God is going to raise people here that will just tell you the truth whether our choice are darker or not. Yeah. I love how Jesus approached that rich young woman. I wonder which apostle today will let a rich young ruler leave his church because he was not willing to bow down to the word of God. The Bible says Jesus just looked at him going and he told his disciples, how hard is this for such people to get born again? I can tell you, today because many just want to find, they have fallen into many traps and desires and plunged into ruin and destruction. Their end is ruin and destruction. It is written in your Bible. Believe me. What are you living for? What is your goal in life? Are you satisfied in Jesus? Or your decision is made because you want to make a lot? Jesus is not going to lead us into abject poverty. I told you contentment does not mean poverty. Paul is also saying here, I have known how to have plenty, but I also know how to, 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 to be hungry. So it means also he was contented, but he also had a lot at some point. So you get this, but that is not what he was living for. So that even if a lot of offering came, that was not his goal in life. He tells them, oh, your offering have come. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. What a man of God. What a man of God. He did not say, now calm down. So today there are so many men of God that if you bring that seed, let me pray for you. I know, I knew a certain man of God who really influenced my life. He said when a politician would visit his church, would look for some youth chairman and send him to pray for him. He would not go to pray for them. They should respect men of God. Today, so many men of God are so cheap that politicians just think it is just a bash and they are done. Yeah. We need some men of God who, I do not know. You need to read the scriptures. 
<laughs> when Peter appeared to them, Peter told them, decide for yourself whether it is right to obey God or you. Those were the men of God. They collected nothing from them. They were living for a purpose. Verses 10 says this. He says, for the love of man, not man, is the root of all kinds of evil. All kinds of sin. The love of man is the root. Now we don't hear those scriptures being preached. But my friend, it is in your Bible. The love of man is the root of all kinds of evil. Think about any sin. The reason why some of you are cheating in exams, I don't know whether you are finished doing those exams, because you love money. The reason why some of you are going to mess up in the teaching practice where you went, because there was some teacher who told you you are looking good and gave you some money to go buy some clothes. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. It does not say man. It is the love of man. Do you wake up just thinking, oh, 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 my friend, do you love Jesus? He asked Peter, do you love me more than this all? Are you rejoicing in the Lord? Is your joy in Jesus Christ? Is your joy in Jesus Christ? Today people do not love God and whatever God says is not being followed. There are certain things that we love that even if there was a free money being given by a politician or something that was happening, we will run there. But to seek the face of God, we've lost the passion for Jesus. People do not love God. People love God because of what they are going to get from God. But this is not it. This is not it. When Jesus saw a multitude following him, and because they love the man, they love the bread, Jesus had to stop them and tell them, are you following me because of what you are going to get? Or are you following me because you love me? Why are you following Jesus? Are you satisfied in Jesus? Or there is something that if Jesus will not give you, you are going to live tomorrow. Paul said, I have learned in whatever the state I am in to be content. Whatever Jesus now gives me is just an addition. My heart is rejoicing in the Lord. My heart is happy in the, in the Lord. I rejoice greatly in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever happens, I rejoice in the Lord. Verses 11. Listen to how it expresses this. I don't know whether this version will say, will say this. This version does not have it. But you, O oh man of God, hey, you need to read it in, 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 in this version. He says, but you, O oh man of God, O oh man of God, run from these things and pursue rationalness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Amen. Amen. This was not just the only man he told this. Let me now take you to that Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 4 to 5. Now he started with marriage because some people are not contented in their relationship. He says marriage then must be kept pure. They keep on looking at somebody's girlfriend, they keep on looking at somebody's boyfriend, they are not satisfied. So the scripture combines if you look at your Bible, it is one paragraph. If you look at it in your Bible, it is one paragraph where that scripture is talked about. This paragraph, Hebrews 13 up to verse 6, 13 4 up to verse 6, is one paragraph. Because even on the relationship, people are not contented. They are last. I want to tell you that the issue of contentment is not a topic that is being discussed today only. When God started working with the Israelites, that is what he told them. Remember the Ten Commandment. He told them, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's property or anything that belonged to your neighbor. That was about contentment. So them, be satisfied with what God has given you. Be satisfied with what God has given you. Do not desire somebody's property. Don't look at somebody's wife and start thinking, oh, you wish you had such a wife. <laughs> Do not look at somebody's husband and start thinking, you wish you had such a husband. You're not honoring God. God is saying, be satisfied with what you have. 
Be satisfied with what you have. That is why even marriage is permanent in the scripture. There's no room for divorce. I think one day we need to talk about some of these things because today people just divorce with so jokes. Yet the scripture is so clear about what God says about divorce. Even that what normally we talk about that it is because of sexual morality. It's because you've not understood about that scripture. The Bible says because your heart was hard, Moses gave you permission. People that their heart is not hard, they want to honor God. 13 verses 4 says this. Marriage must be respected by all. And though the marriage bed kept and defined. Some of you think it's because you're not married. Even when you're in a relationship, this covers you. Because God will judge the immoral people and other trusses. I do not know why you have been living. But the scripture is saying, if you do not deal with that state, God will judge you. I don't know what you did in the December holiday. You could be jumping and singing. But the scripture is saying, God will judge you. Don't think you've escaped. You need to face up your sin and deal with it. God will judge you. I want to warn you. Deal with that sin. You know, sometimes you can jump and think everything is right. But sometimes you need to face up these things. It does not mean we may not have an issue. But God is gracious. We must deal with our sin. Let's continue to verses 5. Now we know verses, I think, 5. This is verses 5. We know verses 6. Or actually, we know verses 5b. It's amazing how today we divide the scripture. Why can't we just look? This is one verse alone. But we know this part. Yeah. <laughs> now, NIV says it this way. NIV says, keep your life free from the love of money. How comes you don't know that? Yet yeah, it's still past five. It's, it, it, I'm not even reading past six. That is only past five. It says, keep your life. And he says that, free from the love of money. It's not from money, because money you need. That is why I also came here. But the love of money. The love of money. Keep your life free from it. Now, the disadvantage with me, you may not like what I preach. But the only, dis the only disadvantage that you cannot say it is not written in your Bible. Because me, I'm not just a preacher who parrots. I'm a preacher who shows you. So, you need a hunger shida yangu. Where are you going to go? Are you not reading it in your Bible? Yeah, that is, that is me in James' version. Yaku ni naibu. In a same we are now go by the Is this Don't love man now. <laughs> so how many of you really believe in the Bible? I'm not going to believe in the Bible. I'm not So if you believe in the Bible, at least you see it. So whatever you're going to do with it, it is written there. The only disadvantage is that that thing can never be edited. You will die and leave. The Bible is still going to remain there. You are the people who call me preach of contentment. It's going to be hard. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> it says, keep your life free from the love of man. And now, this thing always says it. <laughs> be content with what you have, not with what you will have. Tosheka na ulicho nacho. See with what you are going to have. Be content with what you have. Are you still seeing on Tosheka to you? Yeah, stop looking at people wearing the relationship and having sleepless nights. Yeah, stop looking at people wearing the relationship and having sleepless nights. You don't know some of them got in that because they are not contented. <laughs> Yeah, some just got in the relationship because they are not contented. So you also want to pursue that. Tosheka too. And why do you, why do you need to Tosheka? Listen, for God has said, hey, if you do not love anything, please love this. For God himself has said, not David, not Paul. For God has said, I, hey, I will never. You need to read it in, Hebrew, in, in Greek. He says, I will never, no, never. That is how it is written there. I will never, no, never leave you. No, 
not forsake you. Amen. My friend, if that is what God is saying, can I not be contented? God has promised. He says, why do we need to be contented? For God has said. Do you believe the word of God? Mungu amesema. I feel like saying it in my mother tongue. <laughs> God has said. My friend, God has said. If there is something that encouraged my heart to be contented in where I am, God has said. I mean, God who cannot lie has said. I, God, will never live a person who is contented. But then this is not for everybody. For God has said, if you are contented, I, God, will never leave you. Amen. Do not be pressured, young girl. You that are in for and you are thinking you are not in a relationship. <laughs> God has <laughs> Yeah, that was not in a life note for you. I know sometimes any sort of pressure that comes to some young girls who are in for beer and they are thinking they are not in a relationship, they are missing out. And God has said, I will never leave you. God helps you. I remember my wife, my wife here in Moy University, she was not in a relationship. She would tell some of those girls that some, some of those girls got into like G5 relationship. Today they are not even married until they fail. Yeah, they get to a one. It was me. <laughs> some God has for them just one touch. One touch. <laughs> God has said, where is your confidence? I can walk boldly. I do not care what is happening in the lives. You know most people are not contented because they are looking at the lives of others. Yeah. So Paul writing to the Corinthians says, some comparing themselves with others are foolish. Yeah. Don't compare yourself with any person. God has said that you never leave him. You not forsake you. Now I need to explain this. You know this, somebody can leave you, but somebody also can forsake you. Those things, those things Two things are different. Let me explain to you as something. There are people that are not left, but they are forsaken. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, think about there are some people that are married today. They got married with that dream husband. But that husband has forsaken them. They're just in one of one or two of my but they are forsaken. Yeah. But God is giving us a double edged thing here. I will not leave you to know forsaken. What a joy. What a joy, my friend. Even if today you do not have, and things are not going how you, you thought they, they should go, I can come to the morning because I thank God, you have saved. You will never leave me, you will forsake me. So that I might go, you should have gone to the next verse, my friend. <laughs> so that, therefore, we may boldly say, that's why you are that, because Muka Shah said, I boldly say, the Lord is my help. Glory to Jesus. Amen. The Lord is my help. I will not be afraid. Glory to Jesus. I will not be afraid. The Lord is my help. I am satisfied where he has allowed me. The Lord, the Lord is my help. What are people telling me? What can men do to me? The Lord is my help. I boldly say, I boldly say. David said, even though I go through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He was satisfied. Whether he was going through the valley of the shadow of death, why? God was with him. For God has said, I will never leave you, Lord. Because you have said that, I say boldly, the Lord is my help. The Lord is my help. I will not be afraid. Why are you afraid, young man? Don't you know that the Lord is your help? Why are you afraid, young man? Don't you know that the Lord is your help? Look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. He has said that he never leave you, not forsake you. This is the God God is living in your life. He is a good God. He is a good God. He is a good God. I want you to bow down your head. Think over those things. The reason why we are satisfied is because God has not left us. If God had left you, my friend, even if you are driving the latest car, what a sorrowful man you are. Even if you are dating the most beautiful girl, what a sorrowful person you are. Even if you are dating the most prominent person, what a sorrowful young girl you are. 
But here our contentment is God who cannot lie has promised. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore we boldly say, the Lord is my help. It's not money that helps me. The Lord is my help. It's not my boyfriend that helps me. The Lord is my helper. It's not even your career that helps you. The Lord is your helper. It's not even your parents that help you. The Lord is your helper. If the Lord was to leave your parents to help you, what would have become of you? The Lord is my help. Oh, that you would confess and say, the Lord is my help. Because the Lord is my help, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. Lord, we thank you. And we bless your holy name, O oh God. This world belongs to you. You say the earth and its fullness is the Lord's. Any person who have a single thing in this world, they owe it to you, O oh God. Nobody owns this world. The world and its fullness belongs to the Lord. But it's that Lord that I will say that he's not going to leave us nor forsake us. I pray for some young girls here and boys whose hearts are troubled. Lord, I pray that they will look to Jesus. They will look to Jesus. Their eyes will go past relationship. Their eyes will go past money. Their eyes will go past employment. Their eyes will go past earthly city. Their eyes will look at his saint of men in Hebrews who look to a city whose builder is God. A city that is not built with the hands of men. Therefore, Jesus was not ashamed to call them his brethren. I pray for their heart, O God. May they find comfort in Jesus. May they find comfort in you, O God. May they be delighted in you. May they confess with Paul, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Through the Lord I can do all things. I can do all things. I have learned the secret of contentment. Lord, I pray for them that they will learn this glorious secret that today has been ignored and is rarely preached. Lord, I pray, confirm your word in the hearts of your people in the name of Jesus Christ that they will live and confess that Jesus is enough, that Jesus is sufficient, that if we have you, O oh God, we have all that we desire. I pray for their heart. You are a glorious king. Receive praise, receive honor. None can be compared to you, O oh God. Be glorified 